Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we're going to be making a video called What Makes a Mosin Rare? Uh, in this video I'm going to attempt uh, to show you guys some rare Mosins and uh, try to give you an idea of how to identify uh, certain aspects of the Mosin Nagant and uh, hopefully become a little bit more uh, familiar with what exactly is entailed in collecting these rifles. Um, I've, I've been lucky enough in my travels to really run into a lot of great people and to, uh, to really glean a lot of information about military rifles over the years and l luckily been able to collect many of these rifles over the years. Um, there's a lot of people I owe that to. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got about military rifles and collecting military rifles was actually from Ray at Moss. Uh, Moss Pawn up there. Ray told me, he's like, look, the only thing worth collecting is something you can afford. I mean, you're not going to afford, uh, you, you're not going to try to collect, uh, let's just say, uh, a rare Belgian double flintlock fancy, I don't know, custom gunsmith made rifle if they're $10,000 and you have to scrape together $10,000 to buy one gun. I mean, nobody's going to buy a $10,000 gun, much less collect multiple $10,000 gun. So that leaves you with the decision of, okay, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to collect what I can afford, well, then what can you afford? Well, Mosins are very affordable uh, in terms of price. And there's a lot of variants out there that are very rare. And a lot of people don't really know they're rare, um, except for collectors. I mean, I, I consider myself to be a slightly, I would say somewhat advanced Mosin collector. I mean, some people may, may uh, argue with that. Now, some folks get into collecting and they, they tend to want to really, um, they're what I call pattern collectors. Now, a guy that's a pattern collector, and it's kind of a, a little phrase that I coined, a pattern collector is a guy that might buy an SKS because he wants an SKS. Okay, he wants an SKS to shoot, so he buys an SKS rifle or something, and all right, I've got an SKS, there you go. That's, uh, he just wants a pattern of that gun for his collection that's maybe clean and functional that he can take out and shoot. Many of us start as that type of collector when it comes to uh, getting into military surplus firearms. And then you have the people that, in my eyes, are a little bit more of the eccentric type of collector that you've got a guy that might collect M9130 Russian service rifles, but he wants every year of every manufacturer type you know what I mean? Like he wants an Eichwerk or a Tula, but he wants like a 1929, 1930, 1931, and he wants to have them on a rack, like going through all the, the range of years and everything. The, you can go that extreme if you want, especially with the 9130s, because the prices on the guns are very, very affordable. So I'll get right into this, the nuts and bolts of this video. I've got some very rare Mosins on the table that we're going to go uh, over here and show you. Many of these M39s that we have right here, these are finished model M39s that I've got right here, these six guns. Uh, these, this is a 9130, and then we got a few carbines here we're going to talk about. These guns were acquired through Classic Firearms, Monroe, North Carolina, a wonderful group of people to work with, and their help was instrumental uh, and getting this video together because they have a lot of these guns laying around. Uh, I'm going to be using a reference material here from Doug Bowser. It's called Rifles of the White Death. Uh, it's a book on Finnish M39s that Doug Bowser wrote. Uh, mine's mine's uh, signed, which I thought was really cool of Doug to sign it for me. But this particular book is, is very, very nice reference material that we're going to be pulling some uh, dates and some production numbers from to kind of help push the point home as to why certain guns are rare uh, more so than others. Now there's probably a person out there that might say, well my Mosin's rare because I'm the only one that owns my gun. Okay dude, whatever. That's fine. That's okay. Look, you want to buy a Mosin just to take it out and shoot it and have fun with it? Do so. You want to own a Mosin, go buy one. Go buy an M9130, take it out and shoot the crap out of it. Don't worry about it. But some folks tend to want to really dive deeper into the intricacies that make these guns so cool. So right out the gate here, the really the easiest way to tell if a Mosin is rare immediately is the one question you have to ask. Is it finished? Is it a finished Mosin? If the answer is yes, then you can pretty much determine that it's considerably more rare than any Russian gun will ever be and has ever been. And that's purely because of production numbers. Uh, right here we look at Russian M91 rifles in the Doug Bowser volume here. Which I'm not going to show you the pages because I don't want to tick anybody off or anything. But uh, right here, 
We've got M9130 Tula and Eichweck M91 uh, rifles, basically M9130. 30 being the designation of when the original M91 was improved and brought up to the specs of the 1930 spec. So an M91 service rifle would be like a long rifle in the original 1891 configuration, a 91 30 being a gun that was upgraded to that certain spec in 1930. The Russians, as you're going to see, utilize that type of system, as I'm going to show you here in a moment. They produced 17 and a half million of those rifles. That's a lot of dang guns. All right. But when you start looking at, you know, M39s, okay, that, that's why I asked, is it Finnish? Finnish M39s is basically like the Cadillac of the Mosin family. They are very, very nice. They've got improved sights. They've got improved stocks with a nice grafted pistol grip into them. They have a modified jam-free magazine, which is an improved version of the feeding system over a standard uh, Mosin Nagant. The stocks are beefier. They are physically heavier rifles. They have fully adjustable sights. The rear sight is adjustable in 25 meter increments, which is really nice to get that super precise point of aim you want. Uh, the front sights are adjustable for windage, which is awesome. they got big beefy ears on the barrels to protect the front sight posts and everything. It's just from a standpoint of construction, the M39 is a much better rifle. And this was Finland's service rifle uh, during World War II and everything like that. We're not going to get into the history of the conflicts that these guns were involved in, but let's just say for the purposes of collecting, M39s are way more rare than a 9130. How many M39s did they make? All right, well, if you look at production numbers, uh, it, M39s primarily were produced by a few different firms. You've basically, you've got Sakos, you've got VKTs, you've got Tikas, and you've got a few other ra odd rare ones and things like that. But for the most part, they're going to fall into a Sako Sky, uh, Sako, VKT, or Tika. Tikas being the most rare. But if you start looking at the production numbers, uh, you're, you're talking less than like 130,000 rifles. That's not a lot of guns. I think we figured it out at one point, and it's like 41 M9130s to every one M39. So it's a stupid ratio of how many, just how common the 9130 is uh, compared to the M39, which is just so much more rare and so much more uncommon. Now, luckily right now, Classic Firearms actually has a ton of M39s. There's never been a better time to get one of these rifles uh, than now. Okay, they're, they're at the moment, knock on wood, they're commonly available. Uh, they are out there, they're reasonably priced, and it is a really awesome opportunity for somebody to get a fabulous shooting rifle for a very fair amount of money, okay? So I'll just put that out there at the very beginning. If you're looking at this video from the aspect of, well, I don't care about getting the super rare, I just want something that is way more rare than just your average Mosin. Well, right out the gate, a fin. Is it a fin? Is it a Finnish marked M91? Is it a Finnish Carcano, for instance, like the Italian Carcano rifle? Is it a Finnish uh, M9130? Is it a 2830? Is it a 27? Is it a 28? There's several model variants of the Finnish service rifles, and they're all very rare and very, very interesting. Okay, and they're just really neat. So that's really the main thing is the production. Now, when you start getting into individual guns, I'm going to go over just a couple real briefly here. Uh, this gun right here has a B-marked barrel, and uh, basically what the B-marked barrel is is a Belgian-produced barrel, and usually your B-marked guns are going to have post-war stocks. Uh, there's three different stock options on the M39 that you're going to see, and when you're looking at a potential specimen to put into a collection, you want to consider things like whether or not the stock's been replaced. On a B-marked gun, it's very common for the stock to be a post-war stock. Uh, because many of these guns, it's suspected, were built on older components. A lot of these B-barreled, uh, Belgian barrel M9, uh, M39s were produced after the war, so it's probably going to be pretty common for them to have replacement stocks. So in the aspect of this gun, it's correct for it to have a replacement stock. Sometimes they're in a wartime stock. Sometimes the stocks were, were fixed and spliced and everything like that. Um, the, the three basic stock variants that you've got, you've got a round splice. Um, that's one way that you can identify a, 90, or a uh, M39 immediately is the type of splice. Uh, Russian stocks are, are usually single piece. They're not spliced like this. Okay. Uh, the square joints on the splice are going to be a post-war stock, so that's an after-war stock. The round joints 
which are on this gun right here, are wartime. So if you're looking at the stock and you see those round joints, then that lets you know it's a wartime stock. It's a correct stock if the date on the receiver is like 1939 or 40 or 41 or wartime, you know that that's the original stock for that gun. And then there's a transitional stock uh, type that you don't see quite as often, but it has like basically a V-shaped uh, splice, and that's a transitional. In between wartime and post-war, it was kind of a type of splicing they were kind of experimenting with. So really the M39, you've got a few different stock uh, options in terms of the way the stocks are made, uh, but all of them are gonna be great shooters. All the barrels have been basically replaced. Essentially, uh, the Finns had a bunch of 91s laying around that they captured and bought various uh, places. And they also understood the importance of being armed with the uh, same gun that their enemy used. Uh, they, they saw Russia as a threat. Obviously, they were. Uh, but they saw Russia as a threat, and they thought that it was important to have the same, basically the same gun. But, of course, the standard 9130 didn't really live up to their to their uh, standards. So that's really where you have the M39 as being really just a culmination of uh, all of the different uh, types of features that they kind of developed uh, from like the M27, M28, M2830. They kind of just took a lot of those features that they liked from those various guns and they just kind of crafted it into the final version of what they consider to be pretty much the ultimate Mosin. The Finns made the ultimate Mosin and that's what the M39 is. A lot of folks get confused about Mosin variants and they don't understand. They think, oh, well, why is this gun 400 bucks when I can buy two Mosins for that? It's just a Mosin. Who's going to pay 400 bucks for a Mosin? Well, does that mean that I'm going to, that, that if somebody wants my M39, that they're going to trade me 41 9130s for it? Because if you're talking pound for pound and dollar for dollar, that's the, the type of ratio you're talking. So we're going to move on. That's a B barrel. That's a that's a pretty rare gun. There's not a lot of the B barrels. I mean, I would say very few, probably less than 3,000. Actually, why am I guessing? Let's see. We got the book right here. So on B barrel production, just to give you an idea, B barrel production, less than 3,000. So I was correct there. There's not a lot of these guns around. So in the world of Mosins, where you're talking 9130s that they made 17 and a half million of, there's only 3,000 of these. And they're not that expensive. There's not many situations in the world of military surplus where you're going to buy one gun of 3,000 for what you'll buy something like this for. They may not be expensive now, but give them, give them 10 or 20 years, they're going to be very, very difficult to locate. All right, here we've got a Tika produced. Uh, M39, this is a 1941 dated, uh, beautiful gun. This one's completely unissued, uh, just a beautiful gun there. Now on the Tikas, they're even more rare. So M39 Tika, it says right here in the book, rare question mark. So uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of uh, varying bits of information about just how many Tika M39s there actually are, but there, there's not a lot. Okay, so if you're ever scoping around, you find a Tika marked uh, M39, it's a great gun. Pick it up. They're very rare. All right, so moving down the line, I'm going to try to pick up the pace because I know I've put out a lot of very general information, and I know some of you are details people and you really want to see like exactly what I'm talking about here. All right, so moving on, this particular gun here is a M39. It's pretty much your run-of-the-mill um, Sako M39, there's not really a lot special about this gun except one very distinct feature, and that's this T on the stock right here, okay? These are extremely rare guns. This T means test, okay? And this is a test rifle, all right? So uh, what, it, what they did is on the storage racks and the armories, they would put the T rifles on the end of each rack. Now, uh, I don't know exactly how many... Um, rifles went in a rack in terms of the way they were stored, but there was only one of these on the end of each rack. So let's just say if there were 250 rifles, for instance, uh, in a rack, there'd be one of these for every 250 guns. So if there was only a thousand guns in a huge rack in a warehouse or armory somewhere, this T rifle, the point of having this was so that an armorer could inspect this rifle and not have to go down the line and inspect every single one because they could assume 
that this rifle could be checked out and if there was no rust developing or no issues at all or any kind of odd kind of things like that that the rest of them were going to be okay so this was the gun that they would go by and they would handle it check it out sign off on it life is good everything's good no rust or uh you know humidity is proper in here we're not having any rust issues or anything like that so that's a t-marked rifle for test that's a very rare gun all right so moving down the line this is an M9130, but the very special thing about this is this is a Tika produced M9130. Uh, these are extremely rare guns. See, it says right here, M9130 made by Tika, 24,000 of them, between 43 and 44. And we see right here that this holds true. This is 1944 Tika uh, 9130. Very, very nice gun. And uh, this is one of the only 9130s that you're ever gonna find with an actual splice stock, just like you see on the M39. So that's a very uh, finish uh, type of trait on a rifle is for it to, uh, to have a two-piece stock. Uh, you got beautiful bluing on this. It does retain the standard 9130 rear sight base, so you don't have the same adjustability of the, uh, of the M39. Uh, you've got the regular barley corn style front sight that they kept on a lot of the older uh, 91s, which is kind of interesting. And uh, this gun just has a mint bore in it. Just a beautiful, beautiful example of a, uh, of a 9130. All right, that's a rare gun. I got that at Classic as well. All right, here we've got, this is what's called a sneak. So this is an M39, except it's built on a 1968 barrel. So uh, a lot of the sneaks that you're going to see came into the country uh, with very late barrels. Most of them between like 67 and 1971. I've seen a couple as late as like 1972. And what a lot of folks think on these sneaks is that they were produced for marksmanship training to train officers in marksmanship and to train soldiers in marksmanship. And also they figured they had a bunch of the parts laying around. They might as well put together a bunch of guns. They probably had stocks left over, barrels, actions. And they thought, heck, why not build the guns? Which, why wouldn't you, right? On sneaks, I don't know if there's sneak data in here, but on a, uh, there's not a lot of sneaks. I don't know an exact number because I don't, I don't have time to look through this whole volume and I didn't think about looking it up, but sneaks are a very rare variant of uh, the M39. They're just, they're awesome. The fit and finish on them is going to be superlative, just wonderful, okay? Um, the condition, they're going to be basically brand new and unfired. Uh, as long as they're, you know, obviously as imported condition and not something that somebody's taken out and, and ragged out. They generally are in pretty good shape. So the M39, that gives you a pretty solid synopsis there over some of the uh, finish variants of the Mosin Nagant. Uh, they're wonderful guns. We are going to move on to a couple of the, uh, the other Russian models too. So really, the best way to tell an M9130 from an M39 really is the difference in the stock. Uh, this is just a wonderful wartime uh, correct M9130 service rifle with a hex receiver. You've got a couple of different versions of the receiver. You have a round receiver and you have a hex receiver. Uh, the round receiver was one of those things that was kind of taken on as a wartime, uh, kind of a hasty thing to speed up the production in wartime. They were under the duress of combat and they needed to really get those guns out in a hurry. So. They went with a round receiver to speed up the production of the rifles and get them out in the hands of the troops quicker. Earlier guns will have a hex receiver, later guns will have a round receiver, and that's generally true on just about any of them. Uh, most of your M39s are all going to be built on hex receivers, that's completely normal. Uh, this rifle, in my opinion, represents an M9130 that I believe will go up in value over the years more so. Uh, than a lot of the Arsenal refurbished ones that you see out there. There's a lot of the um, refurb guns. They go through and they re-blue them and they, uh, they refinish the stocks and all this stuff. And they're, they're visually a really pretty gun to look at and everything. But I think you lose a little bit of the charm of what makes an M9130 a very special rifle in my opinion. And uh, you know, this gun retains some very functional stock repairs that were done at the Arsenal. It's all matching. All the numbers match on it. It's nice and smooth. It shoots good. It's got some nice bluing wear on all the high marks. So you got, you know, legit bluing wear from service use. Um, you've got multiple stock repairs. 
And in my opinion, this rifle represents what I think a 9130 in a collection should be. There's a ton of refurbs out there. A lot of 9130s were arsenal refurbished after the war and then put into storage. And a lot of the 9130s that we're getting in the country are ones that just come in in these giant crates and they're arsenal refurbished. And they're cool and it's good if you want a shooter or something like that. But generally, if you want a gun that, in my opinion, is a little more collectible, you really want to go for a non-refurbished gun with original wear and something that hasn't been restored. Because if it's been refurbished, it's not really the same gun it was back in the war. But this 9130 could just be laying around somewhere on a battlefield in World War II. And this, this gun looks like I might have just picked it up and cleaned it up and sat it on the table here. And, uh, and it never went through any kind of refurbishment. I think these guns, now people probably think I'm crazy, but I think these guns will go up in value more than the standard Arsenal refurbished 9130s. I mean, you got to think, there's 17 and a half million of them. There's a ton of them out there, so I think these are going to be a lot more desirable in the years to come. Just putting that out there for what it's worth. So now getting into carbines. Um, there's a lot of different carbines, and again, you're going to really get into some of the weirder ones. Obviously, the M38 and the M44 being the most popular and well-known of the different carbines that are out there. M39, or the M38, I'm sorry, is just a standard gun that lacks a bayonet, but it's a short rifle. And then the M44 and uh, M53 are variants that have a side-folding bayonet, which I actually have right here. This is a Type 53, and it's got a side-folding bayonet. So the... The Russian M44 and the Type 53 will both have a fixed side folding bayonet and they're very interesting guns and they're awesome. Carbines are generally going to be a little more valuable and a little harder to find than the standard long guns. They made a lot less carbines than they did long guns and that's generally true really of any type of military gun that's out there. Uh, if they made X number of rifles in a military gun, whether it's an Enfield or a Mauser or any military gun, you can always assume that they made less carbines than they did full-size guns. Carbines were usually reserved for special troops, radio operators, tank drivers, tank uh, occupants, you know, tankers uh, would be issued small rifles to be able to get in and out of a tank easily. So uh, they were generally reserved for specialized and rear D troops. They really weren't intended to be a frontline weapon. They were meant to be a personal defense firearm uh, for a guy who may not be on the front lines. Now, what we've got here is uh, in the collector's world, this is what we call a sanitized M9159. So again, getting uh, onto those date uh, designators, that's really a really... Um, telltale sign of how you can tell where these guns kind of came from. The Russians are always going to have like a 91 slash and then whatever the revision might have been. So in 1959, they took a bunch of 91s and cut them down to carbines and just made carbines out of them. That's really just that simple. Uh, there's not a lot of these out there. They're, they're not stupid uncommon, but they certainly are collectible. And uh, they're much more collectible than something like a uh, M38 or M44 or a Type 53 would be. Um, and this is a scrubbed gun. It's very well fit, uh, nice bluing, nice stock. And on the 9159s, the, the, the primary way you're going to be able to tell this gun when you pick it up is, uh, one, it's got an actual M38 stock and it's not an M44 stock that's been cut. Okay. And then two, it's a sight base. This is the only Mosin that has a ground down sight base. So they just took a standard M91 sight that came on the gun and then they just ground away the graduations from 1100 to 2000 yards. That's the way you can tell pretty much right out the get on that. Now, moving on, I've got another rare one here. This is a Czech produced M91 slash 38. Extremely, extremely rare gun. There's probably only about 3000 of these in existence. Most of them are on antique receivers. Uh, I'm not really going to go into a lot of detail on this. This gun is still in the Cosmoline. It's been unfired. Uh, it's a very uncommon and very rare version of the Mosin. You're not going to encounter this rifle often. Uh, you'll see the light colored stocks where they were replaced. It's basically a hex receiver carbine. Okay, it's just been cut down from a 91 Dragoon into a carbine. That's it. It's really one of the only carbines in the Mosin family you're going to find with a hex receiver. That's why they're so rare. 
So again, pay attention to that. If you're, if you're looking at different rifles on a rack, let's say there's 30 carbines on a rack somewhere and you're looking through them. Well, if one of those carbines has a hex receiver, well, guess what? You automatically identified the rarest gun out of the bunch. But if you ever see a carbine with a hex receiver, buy it. Those are very uncommon. All right, so getting back to this Type 53, uh, China also produced a bunch of Mosins, uh, primarily carbines. And uh, these guns, to find them retaining any kind of matching numbers on them is extremely uncommon. Now, this stock is rough and it's in crummy shape, but every single number on this gun matches all the way down to the, to the uh, butt pad, butt plate, and the uh, floor plate. So this is all matching Type 53, which makes it incredibly rare uh, compared to some of the others that are out there. Um, I know this has been information overload. There's a lot of information in this video to put out. Uh, we can go over more. What I'm probably going to do is clear the table here. We're going to grab a couple of other guns. I'm going to show you how to identify an X sniper rifle. In the world of 9130s, your X snipers are going to be worth uh, a little more money. I wouldn't say a lot. And uh, right now, these guns are still priced, uh, you know, cheap enough to where you can you can buy them and uh, and really afford to collect them. Uh, a lot of folks have some really nice advanced Mosin collections. Um, we're going to clear the table. I'm going to show you how to identify a couple of the other variants that are out there. All right, I lied. There's actually more guns than I thought there were. So we're going to go over a few more. Hopefully you guys can uh, stick with me a little bit longer. I know this is a long video. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of more M39s I found that are also uh, pretty rare. Um, yeah, I've probably got a little bit of a problem. I admit it. Uh, we were just talking earlier about how many dang uh, Mosins I've got. But um, I wanted to make this video really just to, to show some of the weird ones that are out there and, and hopefully help uh, the would-be shopper or collector, whoever's looking at these guns, hopefully identify it a little bit better and really know what you're getting yourself into. So uh, that's kind of the spirit in which we're making this video, which is why we're showing so many different ones off. Uh, before we move on to the M91s, which we have here, and the X-Sniper, I'm going to show you a couple of 39s. Uh, here is an important date range to remember. Uh, when you're looking at different M39s, anytime you see that sky marking, like a Sako sky marked gun, uh, that's usually a Civil Guard uh, marking, and the Civil Guard serial numbers are 500,000 or higher. So anytime a gun has a 5 on it, and it's over 500,000 in terms of your uh, production numbers, that's a Civil Guard gun, and that's always going to command a little bit higher of a premium. Uh, this particular Civil Guard marked M39 is one of Chad's out of his collection, and it actually retains the proper Civil Guard sling. Okay, so the Civil Guard slings are going to be a little bit more of a web sling instead of a leather sling, and the web slings were actually retained from the earlier 27s, 28s, 2830s, uh, the Civil Guard preferred this sling to a leather sling, and they designated that their rifle uh, retained that original type sling. Um, Civil Guard, kind of the best way to explain it, it think kind of like National Guard. The Civil Guard was sort of like a... They were a really weird military force. I mean, they were basically... They had these districts all around Finland, and each Civil Guard district was responsible for training and arming and and deploying troops from certain districts. So a lot of these guns also retain, in fact, while we're thinking about it, this is my Civil Guard marked gun. The marking on the right side of this rifle actually refers to a certain district that the Civil Guard was issued to this gun. So these rifles that are Civil Guard marked or in the Civil Guard uh, serial number range can also be tracked back to the district they were issued in. Now, I don't have that information in front of me, obviously, but a lot of people confuse this number on the right side of the receiver for serial number. It's actually not a serial number, it's a district number. And there's a, somewhere online you can find like a huge list of districts and you can uh, actually, uh, <laughs> you can go back and track exactly where this rifle was issued, which is totally cool. And that makes these guns a little bit more uh, desirable, okay? The sling that's on this rifle is actually a later sling. This is a, a late leather sling. It's kind of a dyed uh, greenish color. Uh, it's basically like reindeer leather. Very supple and soft, wonderful sling. All right. And this is a gun I, I bought at Classic as well. Moving down the line, um, <laughs> a lot of guys are going to give me grief about this. I just know it. Uh, so this rifle, pretty much your standard M39, except for 
It's a Saco M39, but one of the markings that you're going to find on this gun all the time is an SA in his little box. And that designates, uh, you know, Finnish Army property. The early Finnish Army property mark was this long P word here. I'm going to try to say it. I think it's uh, Polo, Polo Lustiatos or Polo, lo, uh, Polo lo, Lotto Lustiatos or whatever. It's this long P word. Okay, and they did it for like two or three months in 1941, and they said, you know what, screw this. That's way too much effort to put that long word on there. And they just started doing the little SA in the box stamp. So if you find a Postalolo Lodiados marked M39, then you can pretty much say, yeah, that's a pretty rare gun. Not a lot of those guns out there. I just wanted to uh, kind of show that off. On the slings, on the M39s, you're generally going to see either a web sling, a reindeer leather sling with a square buckle, or you'll see some early brown leather slings with a round buckle. And some of them, various stages of repair, various markings. In fact, there's a double SA marking right there on that sling. So the slings are finished property marked as well. Just wonderful guns. I could talk about them all day, but I'm trying not to bore you guys. On the M9130s, you definitely want to try to locate X snipers. Um, right here, if we open this rifle, there's two plugged holes in the receiver. Um, the X sniper rifles are extremely accurate. They generally have really good bores in them, and they shoot really well. If you're wanting to buy a 9130 just to shoot, and you don't care about collectability, try to find an X sniper. They're generally going to shoot a lot better, and there's not a lot of them around. Uh, Russia was really one of the first countries to field and mass produce a sniper rifle. Uh, the PU sniper rifle was heavily fielded. I mean, they made tons of those things. And at the point that the barrels got shot out or they didn't reach or exceed military expectations, they would pull the scope off, plug the holes, and just put them back in the refurbishment program, put them back out uh, into storage, or put them out, back out into frontline use. So, uh, an X sniper rifle basically is not accurate enough to be a sniper by their standards, but definitely accurate enough to take out and plink and uh, shoot stuff with. So, uh, this Mosin right here, being an X sniper, this is the Mosin I actually shoot the most out of my entire collection in terms of 9130s. I shoot the mess out of this gun. So, uh, also another feature we're going to talk about is this sling. This uses dog collars, what they call them. So a 9130 is always going to have like a, a provision for mounting this heavy web sling. Now one area, the, the fin slings are decent, but I tell you, the Russian slings are awesome. I really like the quality of that sling. It's nice and heavy canvas material. Uh, it's really the same type of canvas material they made belts and stuff out of for them. So very high quality material. The bayonets, here we've got a bayonet on this M9130. It's held in on the front sight post. Now this bayonet's been fitted properly. It's really hard to find an M9130 bayonet that fits right. If you got one that drops uh, right on and off, you're lucky. But basically it just goes in, interfaces, little plunger depresses, rotates into place, and you got a fixed cruciform bayonet on the gun. The guns are actually sighted with the bayonets on. That's why this gun has a bayonet on it. When I take it out and shoot it, it shoots perfectly to point of aim because all M9130 service rifles, how many people have ever seen a Mosin bayonet scabbard? Have you ever? Now I know there's some out there, but how many people have actually seen a cruciform M9130 bayonet scabbard? Nobody, right? Because they didn't issue them because the guns were intended to have the bayonets mounted on them all the time. A little, little tidbit for what it's worth. All right, so getting away from M39s, carbines, and 9130s. Uh, you know, on the 9130s, there's also a lot of really odd markings, like Ministry of Defense. Uh, again, we were talking about like the 91-something, uh, right? Well, uh, they have like these guns they call like Ministry guns, and basically it'll have like the 91 marking and then a dash, and it'll have like a refurbishment date. So they might have refurbished it for like guard use. And, you know, you don't want your guards walking around with an ugly gun that's all scratched up and beat up. They want the guns to look real pretty and all blued and all that crap. So in terms of refurbishment, they're generally going to be in really pretty shape. And they wanted their guys walking around, I guess, to look good and everything like that. At least that's the story. I don't know how true it is. To Take that with a grain of salt for what you will. There is a collector's niche that kind of revolves around the ministry uh, defense theory, I guess would be the best way to look at it. Uh, but 
I don't really play too much into it. Yes, I own a couple of them. Yes, they're cool. Uh, would I pay a premium for them? Probably not. That's just me. All right, identifying an M91. All right, we've got a couple of M91s here. Now, this is the rifle that really started it all. Uh, the French produced the first M91 service rifles were made by the French, and the Russians actually reneged on the contract. They ordered a bunch of them. They said, oh, yeah, we'll buy them, and then they ended up not buying the first batch. Uh, they bought some. French produced 91 service rifles are some of the rarest Mosins out there. Uh, you'll know the Tang... Uh, if you pull the gun apart and you look under the tang, you'll see a C with a circle. It's a chatrelet or chatrelet. I can't say that word. It's some French word, and I'm not French. Uh, but it's a C with a circle. Then you know it's one of the earliest produced Mosin receivers ever. If I had to guess, if I pulled out any number of M39s in this room and pulled them apart and looked at them, I guarantee you there's some original French receivers somewhere in this room. I don't have time to pull them all apart. Sorry. You just have to take my word for it. But the French made the first Mosin de Gantz, okay? The French made, really, one of the first guns that fired smokeless powder, period. The 762 by 54 rimmed is one of the longest-serving smokeless powder cartridges in the world. It's the longest-serving military cartridge on planet Earth. It's been in service since 1891, the, the time that this rifle was adopted. So in military rifles, for those of you that haven't picked up on it yet, Generally, the designation of the rifle is usually when the gun is adopted. So if the gun was adopted in 1891, well, then it's a Model M1891. If the gun was adopted in 42, they might call it a Model 42 or whatever. Okay, that's not a Mosin-specific thing, but many military rifles have that designation based on the year it was made. 91s were made by a wide variety of different firms. A lot of people don't know, and unfortunately, I don't have one here to show you, Remington produced... M91 service rifles as well. Uh, many of them actually ended up being used as training rifles right here in the United States. So technically, the Mosin was issued to the United States. Oddly enough, we used them in training uh, because, uh, again, Russia decided not to pay us for them, so we got stuck with them all. Uh, so that's one of those weird little things. So it's, it's not uncommon to find an M91 rifle produced by Remington, produced by Chatrelet, produced by uh, Westinghouse, which is a British firm. And then you've got other various, of course, your Russian, you know, once the Russians got tooled up to make their own guns, obviously you're going to see early Russian guns as well. And, uh, and then I've also got some Finnish M91s. Now, in terms of features, the most distinct way to uh, identify an M91, one, is the length. It's a longer gun. So right now we've got an M9130. You can see just from comparing these two guns, the 9130 has a shorter barrel. That was one of the design aspects that they wanted to change with the 91 to break it up to the 9130 specs is to shorten the barrel. So they're going to have shorter barrels uh, on the 9130s. 91 has a longer barrel. The 91 has a barley corn style front sight with no hood. So if you're looking on a gun rack and you see a ton of Mosins on a rack and one of them's longer than the other, and all the 9130s are there, then you know that this is a 91 because it's got the longer barrel. And there's no front sight protection afforded. That was one thing that added to the 9130 that they felt was important was to be able to protect the front sight post. You've got an upper handguard that's held in place by a couple of really crude sling uh, bands, barrel bands, sorry. And then on your swivels here, it's just a real basic variety of sling swivel that you're gonna see on these, literally just a bar that the sling attaches to. Hexagonal receivers. This particular rifle is pretty interesting too. One marking I want to tell you about that you want to look for. All right, so if you're asleep this whole time, wake up. Okay, on these rifles, if you ever see an AZF mark, you want to buy that rifle if you can because that's an Austrian capture marking and they are extremely, extremely uncommon. Very rare. Collectors will pay a pretty penny for these rifles when they're marked AZF because that really makes the history of this rifle go full swing. I'm not going to go into like all of the little details, but let's just say one guy got killed with it and then the Austrians picked it up and stamped it and then they sold it or, you know, it, the path is traceable all the way around from a bunch of different conflicts all the way up to where the Finnish arsenal came across this thing. 
And of course, it has an SA marking because it's Finnish. It's got a Tika barrel. This is a wonderful, wonderful 91, a great gun to have in a collection. So you do have, just like before we discussed Russian and Finnish uh, firearms, you also have M91 rifles, which are the older designation, that are also Finnish rifles. And many of them were rebarreled, re I'm sorry, in the 40s. So that's common. Now moving back here, we've got, I forget which date this one is. This is a New England uh, Westinghouse, the 1915 date. So you got, a, this is a World War I era uh, M91 service rifle, okay? Really, really cool stuff. So just like we've got the Westinghouse, we've also got a 1915 dated Russian version. And you're gonna have to excuse me because I don't remember the exact markings. I think this one's a Tula, if I'm not mistaken. There's a lot of cool, crude, old markings on these rifles, which are just awesome. And this has a 1915 receiver date. So these two 91s here on the end of the table are 1915 dated, which would definitely coincide with World War I usage, which is awesome. And uh, it's just really cool. The history is definitely there. Um, if I could really leave anybody in this video with a few thoughts about this, because I know this is information overload. There's probably a number of people that are watching this video and they're thinking, man, this is a lot of dang information. Guys, let me tell you, there's probably 10 more guns in this room that I could show you that are different from than these and that are different than the first ones I showed you. There are so many unique variants of the Mosin and Gantt rifle and that's what makes them so fun to collect. Imagine being a stamp collector and you know that there's, I mean, how many stamps out there? Thousands, right? That's what makes stamps so interesting to collect. If there was only like one or two types of the gun, it'd be like, all right, well, let me buy the one or two types and then I've got them all and then move on with life. You are never going to get every little variant of the Mosin that's out there. There are so many of them. They were made and used by so many different countries. I mean, there are so many ones that we didn't get to talk about in this video, like Romanian contract guns. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's Czech guns. There's, hell, there's East German Mosins out there. Those are stupid rare, of course. There's some guns you're just not gonna find in the US. So there's a ton of awesome history that surrounds these firearms, the men that used them, the conflicts that they were involved in, down to the cartridge they shoot, down to um, just the improvement of them, seeing the, you know, that what started as the 91 and then really kind of uh, integrating into the 9130, and then seeing, all right, the 9130 is a cool gun, and then see it in integrate into the M39. Really, on this table right here, I've got the complete history of this gun from where it was originally conceived all the way up to the perfection of the, of the famous Russian service rifle, which would become the Fen M39. In my opinion, one of the finest military surplus rifles that you can get today, bar none. In the next 10 or 15 years, these guns are going to go up in value stupid high. Some of the odd and interesting variants are already bringing some really good money and uh, people are starting to see that they are a fun collectible. If I could leave a, a thought with anybody in this video, I know it's overwhelming. I'd probably urge you to kind of, uh, don't take it too seriously. That's the biggest thing. Now I laid out the groundwork and I kind of showed you some really cool stuff to look for, but don't take it too seriously. If you want a Mosin to shoot, go buy a dang Mosin out of a crate that's a refurb and go stick a bullet in it and go shoot it, okay? Don't worry about it. If you wanna collect them, maybe now you know a little bit more about what's rare and what's not, you know, what, what may not be super common. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot more information out there than what I put out in this video. This is just scratching the surface. Uh, what I'm trying to really encourage people to do is to get a little bit more well-versed in some of these guns, especially if you're interested in collecting them um, I would encourage you to seek out some further reading. You know, pick up uh, Doug Bowser's book, you know, Rifles of the White Death. It's a great read. Uh, it's got a ton of great information in it. Uh, there's a ton of other great volumes out there on Mosins. Uh, one of these days, maybe I'll write a dang book if I can get my wife to help me with it because she has to do all the, you know, she's the, she's the brains behind the whole operation. So if I write a book, she's gonna have to proofread it like a million times to make sure I'm not all screwed up. But there's a ton of great volumes out there. I would encourage you to look through them all. Uh, there's way more information that can be put out in just this short video. But uh, I appreciate you watching. This is a part of, uh, of guns that are very uh, precious to me. I love military rifles very much, and I love the Mosin. It's one of my favorites. 
And uh, this is a, a part of, of gun collecting that I hold very dear and true to my heart. I really love military guns. And uh, I really wanted to share this with people so they can get a little bit better idea of what they're getting themselves into. Uh, and I tell you, it's, it's a long road. If you buy one, you're going to want to buy more. And I'm telling you, it's an addicting, addicting hobby to collect military rifles because there's so many of them. And uh, it's, it's a very rewarding hobby, in my opinion, because you really get to share the history with people. And I think that's the most important aspect of collecting these rifles is really, truly understanding the history understanding where they went, where they're going, and the people that used them, and understanding their struggles. No matter what side you were on, or no matter what side you support, that's irrelevant. To me, military rifles and collecting those military rifles is about honoring their heritage and honoring the struggles they went through, the men that carried them, what they went through, and trying to kind of relate to that a little bit and understand their perspective and understand what they went through. And I, I think that's a very important aspect of collecting militaria is, uh, is honoring the dead, honoring the people that, that own these before me. That's a big part of it. And, and sharing that information with the future generation. I think there's a lot of folks out there that, that might be getting into military collecting, especially with games like Battlefield and all these modern video games. Uh, maybe they're confused and they don't know what is what or what's good and what's not. So videos like these, in my opinion, are really meant to try to educate the younger audience and some of the people that are a little bit more information hungry and really need the information on these guns. So hopefully this was a primer for you that got you pointed in the right direction. Maybe share this video with your gun-toting buddies and uh, let me know what you think of this idea. We're going to do more of these. Uh, maybe we'll revisit this type of video with some of the Swiss rifles. Maybe we can do uh, some stuff on Mosins, Enfields, Martinis. You let me know. Whatever you want to see, I'll gather all the guns together and uh, we'll cut the video. So just let us know what you want to see and we'll do it. Uh, thank you for your time. I know this was a long video. We have a lot more fun stuff on the way. I know my, my dry, boring uh, self <laughs> can't watch me like this all the time, but I do appreciate, appreciate you watching. Uh, we got more videos on the way. We'll catch you next time.